Hey everybody, two alpha gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing alpha gal syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. Hey, everybody. So we are super excited today to have Jason Lindy, who is the Senior Vice President of Advocacy at FAIR, which is the Food Allergy Research and Education Organization. We got to see Jason a couple of weeks ago in person. So he is here with us today. Welcome, Jason. Well, thank you, Candice, and thank you, Debbie. It's always great to be with the Alpha Gals, and I uh, really just appreciate all that you're doing uh, for the for the community. Oh, my goodness. And we are so appreciative of all that you are doing for the community okay. at large for those of us with food allergies. So let's dive in. Can you sure. just tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, so I'm Jason Lindy. Uh, I am the, like you said, you gave my title. I've been at FAIR now for three and three quarters years. Uh, I know a lot about food allergies because I was born with them. And so I grew up in rural upstate New York, uh, the last county of Appalachia. It actually stretches up into upstate New York. Yep, little town called Richfield Springs, uh, population at the time about 1,500, one stoplight. I was the my mother couldn't figure out why her youngest child was um, blotchy and ill-tempered and just horrendous to deal with, always, you know, upset. Uh, and it took two years and many different visits to the doctors. And it found she found out that me, the grandson of a dairy farmer from rural South Dakota, also had a dairy allergy, uh, also a tomato allergy and a few other you know, environmental things, uh, but it made life a lot different. Um, I know uh, a few weeks ago it was Halloween. This was always my love-hate uh, holiday, simply because I ended up giving away half my candy to my older brother uh, because anything with milk, chocolate, that was all off limits. So I, you know, I grew up with food avoidance and my mom making separate meals for me, you know, ever since I can remember, uh, frankly. And then as an adult, uh, blessed with a child who had the atopic march. It started with eczema, uh, moved to asthma, and then uh, I'll never forget, we found out he had a shellfish allergy years after, you know, he'd had lobster and crab before. And then at seven, um, he uh, went into anaphylaxis at a birthday dinner for myself at a seafood restaurant, a lobster restaurant. And I just took him right to the hospital. I mean, I recognized and understood it. And so I've been living this as both a person and as a patient for, as a parent, excuse me, for uh, many decades, many decades. And uh, prior to all of that, or along with all of that, I've had an advocacy background. Uh, I was uh, used to manage campaigns in every region of the country, uh, worked for some large uh, communications firms, and then was the chief of staff or senior advisor to three different members of Congress. Um, so I've been both inside the building and then outside the building in terms of creating awareness uh, and working on behalf of issues and causes and candidates that I believe in. That makes a lot of sense why you got involved with FAIR too. Both pieces yeah. of that, both your advocacy work and your experience with allergies, both as a person who lives with them and as a parent. You know, yeah. I'm curious, has your approach to allergies been different as a person living with them versus as a parent of a child with them? Yeah, yeah, it has. Um, and um, it, it has, uh, it really has. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a different sort of take. Um, it's one thing when it's yourself. Uh, it's a totally another thing. Uh, I'm blessed with one child. And so it's another thing when it's your child. And so, you know, he's, uh, he's in college. I, I get on him pretty hard about Carry those EpiPens and and that sort of thing, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, the great thing, just you know, going back to it all, is it, it feels wonderful to live the mission and work the mission, um, right? You know, oftentimes in a job, we exhibit different sides of ourselves, right? And I kind of feel like the advocate part of me has always been part of who I am, um, standing up for what I believe in. And so the nice thing is, is it takes something I'm very comfortable and understanding with food allergies uh, and puts me in a position where I can help others with it. And that's really gratifying um, to have. And that's why I love the job. 
It's because I get to hang out with people like you and I get to hang out with other advocates and, and help them try to make their lives a little bit better by passing laws and doing things to improve the our, our quality of life. Yeah. And that is such a beautiful thing to hear, especially for, you know, someone that has lived with this their entire lives. Debbie and I don't have that perspective. We had adult onset allergies. Did you have any like one particular experience maybe as a teenager that like sparked this passion to go further with it, especially, you know, cause you've always kind of been in advocacy work. Was there one particular experience that stands out to you at all? Well, one I'm not so proud of and not related to the mission at all is, so I did very well at Syracuse, my undergrad. Okay. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. Uh, you know, and so I went to law school, ironically, I went to law school at the same place where my son goes to undergrad, Wake Forest. And I like to joke that I went from Phi Beta Kappa to academic probation in a year. It's almost the entire truth. Um, and, uh, it's close to the truth. Let's put it that way. Not quite academic probation, but not exactly doing well. I mean, I wanted to be this crusading attorney, right? right. And I'll never forget, I'm struggling and I'm just dying in law school. And I'm like, what's going on? So I see a guy, a career counselor, take the Myers-Briggs personality test and I get the result back. And she's like, look in the box of where you are and what professions come nicely with that. And tell me, do you see the word attorney there? I'm like, no. And she's like, that's why you're struggling. And so I'm a global thinker. Uh, at the time, I had undiagnosed ADHD, not exactly a great thing to have in law school where it's all 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and what's the exceptions to 1, 2, and how does that prove 3? Like that sort of stuff. I, I just thought it was about rhetoric and arguing and writing. Um, and so that's really where my, my life got turned on its head. Uh, and I thought there's got to be something else. And fortunately, I found political campaigns, which my skill set and the ADHD, when when your whole life revolves around an election six weeks or six months now, it's an incredibly focusing mechanism, right? And so it's like, okay, what are we doing today to win? And I love that. It's like, hmm, let me do some long-term planning for the next three years. Not so good. Not so good. Um, but yeah, so that was really the, the signal moment. And then I just kind of Took the career where I could, and um, and running campaigns is not suitable for when you, at least not for me and my family, uh, when you have a child involved. I had to do a little bit when he was younger, uh, but yeah. So that's that that's the moment where I was like, hey, you know, maybe we don't risk our entire economic future on election day. Maybe we actually have stability beyond November seventh. That might be nice for the family, and so. That might might be yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. And so I, uh, so I was like, okay, we, we need to find something where election day is important, but not so important that you worry about, do I have to call Wells Fargo to ask for an extension on the mortgage? So. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, so instead of a crusading attorney, you just became a crusading advocate because we yeah. know about some of your advocate work. And I would love to talk a little bit about that, specifically your initiative to make epinephrine affordable. Can you tell us some of the things you've been doing and the successes that you've had? Yeah, uh, a lot of successes, a lot of swings at the bat. Not going to lie. It's hard. But to me, look, there's more than 33 million Americans with life-threatening food allergies. There's a, probably an undercount if you take into account... Uh, the alpha gal community, you take into account people allergic to latex or to insect bites. We've got to be close to 40 million, right? There's no reason that epinephrine on injectors, a two pack should run anywhere between 500 to $700. And that's with people with insurance. Um, you know, I read just recently that um, Viatris, which is now the name of Mylan, um, they made uh, three quarters of a billion, that's B, billion of dollars from our community on uh, EpiPens for the last two years. So $750 million they made. And to me, like the food allergy community is large and diverse. It is large and diverse as this country is, is, is great, right? Um, you know, I talk to a lot of people, middle class, upper middle class, who have the opportunity and time to volunteer 
What we don't see often is the people I grew up with in rural upstate New York, or I was a arc welder uh, one summer at General Motors. Uh, you know, I welded cars for second shift and it taught me, I mean, it taught me a lot, but those folks are busy, yeah. right? And yet they're working every darn day to make their lives better. And they've got to go to CVS or Walgreens and shell out, you know, $1,000, $1,400 for two two packs if they have a child with a peanut allergy or any kind of allergy. And for you, right, for the alpha gal community, there is just no reason. So for me, to, to me, it's a matter of economic justice. It's a matter of putting medicine in the people's hands who need it. Um, and it's really what I would consider, folks, and whatever your economic status is, frankly, I don't know anyone who can just shell out $700 and think this is nothing, right? I, I've yet to meet that person. Um, and if you have to buy two, um, it's $1,400. So the wind up here, sorry, Debbie and, and Candace. The no, wind no. Up is, so necessary. Yeah, the, it's so yeah. necessary. Like I, yeah. I'm nodding my head as you're talking. Yeah. I, I so, kind of, I endured that last year where like I had a $10 copay with one insurance the previous year. So I, it wasn't a strain. And then this year it's over $400 for me to get, yeah. I, I, and I can't imagine being, you know, it, it, in a, in a tight bind where that is not, it's not feasible for our family. I can imagine right. for anyone else. It's, it's just, it's infuriating. So I apologize yeah. for interrupting. No, you. no, no. I, I just didn't want your, your audience thinking I was long winded. I am, mm -hmm. but I try to be mindful <laughs> of it. Um, <laughs> but so recently in the last five years, there's been a push among diabetics to cap the cost of insulin. And I know the federal government under uh, this administration is trying to do that. Um, we basically, are trying to follow the same road. It's unlikely that the federal level will be successful, but we have worked in a handful of states to introduce and thankfully pass some bills that have been signed into law. Um, earlier this year, uh, in both Colorado and Illinois, FAIR worked hand in hand with uh, the, the state representatives and the organizations on the ground uh, pushing this in Colorado, uh, we were able to have a price cap of $60 for a two-pack of epinephrine. Um, and in Illinois, it's the same. And so what does that mean? Well, Colorado has more than 550,000 individuals who rely on epinephrine every day. In Illinois, it's 1.25 million state residents who are never going to pay more than $60 per two-pack. And to me, that of all the things, because there are so many needs out there, there is no greater return on investment of our time um, or our advocates' time than it would be to cap the cost of epinephrine. It just, that is to me sort of the goal. That is, if I had one thing to work on only all day, every day, it would be that. Um, fortunately, I have to deal with, I work on other bills, obviously, state restaurant training bills, this sort of thing. One coda, though, to the Colorado bill, Teva, the manufacturer of generic epinephrine auto injectors, is suing the state of Colorado over that law. Um, yeah, they're trying to uh, they're trying to get it thrown out. And so, you know, of course, because we're shutting, we're we're slowing down the, the profit. I will say this. So just so everyone's clear. It takes, it costs $8, San Jose Mercury News found in 2016, it cost $8 to manufacture and make an epinephrine auto injector. It's $60, it's still 700% profit, right? right. Uh, roughly speak. And they're still making $52 out of every 60. And so, okay, it's not 500, it's not 600 and this sort of thing. And I know there's other players involved, but we just feel like, look, the the thing we can do best for our community is cap the cost. It's hard. I've heard more no's than yes. We have advocates in a ton of other states working on this right now, meeting with their state representative or their state senator, and a lot are saying no. But uh, to me, like I said, this is this is our push, and we're going to keep at it and as far as we can go, as long as we can go. I want to talk about perspective for a minute on this, sure. because I think yeah. that this is really, it is such a powerful cause that you've taken up because I'm sure that you have a, a specific perspective as the parent of a child who needs epinephrine. Yeah. I imagine that you make ends meet and are able to buy epinephrine 
just like I am, just like Candace yeah. is. We don't want to pay a ton of money for it. And then you've got the people who are out there who really can't afford it, who have to choose between other medications or meals or, you know, yeah. clothing that's needed, anything. And then I think about some of the people we've met at the fair summit, right? I do, I I'm blessed. My children do not have allergies, but we met people who had not only, you know, children with life-threatening allergies, but people who had lost children. Yes. Yeah. Epinephrine is necessary for across the board for you, right. for me, for these moms and dads out there, for these kids. And yeah. so I just want to commend you for the work that you're doing. Oh, thanks. And are there things that we can do as a community yeah. living in our various states? You know, Candace and I are down here in Virginia that we can do to support this mission, specifically this mission to, to cap the cost of epinephrine. Yeah. I mean, the easiest thing to do is this uh, two steps. First thing is, uh, and I, and um, I'm happy to work with anyone who's hearing this. Um, there's just but one of me. There's only three people on our advocacy team. I handle all state stuff. And so I always feel bad about not being so great at responding to emails. It takes me a little time, but eventually I do. And eventually we get a meeting scheduled. The very first thing uh, Candace and Debbie and those listening can do is make an appointment with your state representative or state senator. These are the people that represent you at your state capitol. So in Virginia, uh, it's Richmond. In Pennsylvania, it's Harrisburg. These are not the people who work for you in Washington, D.C. Totally different group. And what you want to do is go in and, you know, Debbie, If like you mentioned, a lot of people have children with life-threatening food allergies. If your child is old enough and can tell their own story, bring them in to the meeting. And, you know, this is like seven, eight, ten. And you sit down with the state representative or your state senator and bring the epinephrine auto injector and say, you know, representative X, you know, this is why this is my son or daughter. Or this is, you know, her allergies. Uh, she's, you know, we have to buy two pen, two packs cost this much money. And we really hope that you would introduce a bill to cap the cost of epinephrine in our state. Um some people believe that, you know, government shouldn't be involved in the free market. And in the answer back is that may be, be your belief, but the free market hasn't solved this problem. Epinephrine auto injectors have been around for 36 years. The price increase has gone up 400% or more in the last few years. CNN reported on this. So it's not as if the market has solved this out. There's more than five providers and yet it's still outrageously expensive. Um, where folks if folks are really interested in this and want to put a cap in on their state, reach out to me. I'll give you my email address. It's jlindy, L-I-N-D-E, at foodallergy.org. Uh, one more time, jlindy, L-I-N-D-E, at foodallergy.org. Just put it in the subject line. I want to cap epinephrine or I want to cap EpiPens. Uh, I'll be sure to you know, the cost of EpiPens, and I'll be sure to respond to you. Maybe a few days. Don't get discouraged. Like I said, uh, I'm involved in 21 different state uh, advocacy uh, actions right now. Uh, so we'll stretch thin. Um, but uh, but I this to me is like, this to me is, like I said earlier, our number one, our number one effort, right? Because regardless, this will impact our community the most, I believe. And for the years to follow, right? Once you cap it, we're good to go for, you know, for the foreseeable future. So. Yeah. And we're so appreciative of that. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. I think we could talk for hours just yeah. about the different perspectives and disparities out there with this, you know, issue, but are there other ways that our listeners can help support fair's mission? Yeah. I mean, our... yeah. And I'm sorry to interrupt Candace. Yeah. And Look, gals, I'm happy to come to Richmond and work with y'all. So, like, if if you want to meet with your own representatives, we 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 can we could do a little, you know. Let's do it. Do, yeah, you could bring a, you can have a little, you can a little have a little guest update here in a couple of months, uh, and uh, we can take it from there. Uh, yeah, look, uh, we are we are small um, by ways of nonprofits. Um, we are small in size. We're about forty five individuals. It's um, you can learn more about fair at foodallergy.org. Look, the, the easiest response is if you can make a small contribution, 10, 25, 50 bucks, 
whatever you can, if you can think about us, I know we're coming to the end of the year, it's tax deductible, um, but anything you can give uh, would be wonderfully appreciated. Um, it goes to our mission, it goes to the mission of my colleagues, uh, whether that's research for a cure, um, whether that's education and support, um, you know, and obviously to to advocacy as well. Um, but we're we're very efficient. We're very lean. Um, there is not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of frills here. And uh, and but and and we we do right by your contribution. Um, we really do. So uh, anything you can do on that. end. the other thing is, is you can always volunteer. Um, I'm not the person for that. Uh, I only handle it on the advocacy side. Uh, but if you just send a, I believe our general email is info at uh, foodallergy.org. Uh, I believe that's what it is. Um, if it's not, uh, ladies, I can send you what it is and you can put it in the show notes. I'm sorry. Don't know what it is uh, <laughs> off the top of my head. But yeah, I mean, you can always volunteer time. You can do walks. There's a whole bunch of different things that we're doing uh, to support the the community. And, and to me also, this is one community that includes alpha gal um because i don't care what the cause of the what the allergy is the result is still the same our struggles are still the same um and i would actually say that your struggles are more challenging in so many ways than than others so well we all have challenges that is for sure that is for yeah. sure but speaking of alpha, alpha gal <laughs> um are there plans to include alpha gal as one of the allergy communities and fairs initiatives yeah, I mean, we're obviously we're having conversations uh, with uh, with TBC United and and those great folks, and I, I'm looking for opportunities on the advocacy side in the states, um, especially um, to work together. And so it's it's a matter of uh, often people come to me and say, "What about this? Could we do this?" And I'm really and and frankly, I'm open to doing that. Uh, next year and the years that follow. So yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited about that in ways that we can work together. It was so encouraging to see the panel that you put together at the summit and hearing, you know, the very opening remarks where Alpha Gal was included. Because we, you know, so often I think in these past years, we've kind of been in this limbo state as yeah. we were tick-borne but we're not a disease technically, you know, and then it is a food allergy. It's yeah. not, so it's been, it was really awesome. Debbie and I felt so validated to see how much consideration was put into the summit to include alpha gal this year. And we're just yeah. so excited to see that grow and yeah. really be embraced by this community. I mean, we just, we love everything that you all are doing at fair and, just the authenticity. Everyone is just, you can tell they've been directly impacted by food allergies for the most part. And they're so passionate. You know, you all are so passionate about what you're doing to help this very large community. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, and, and that's how we want to, that's how it's the only way we can grow is to grow together. Right. Um, and, uh, and I'm, and I'm so supportive of what you're going through, uh, the challenges, um, I'll never forget. I was lobbying a staffer up in, up on the Hill and she's from Alabama. And she said to me, you don't have to say another word about food allergies, Jason. I have alpha gal and I know exactly what your folks are going through. And we all, and I know you've mentioned this in previous podcasts, the reason I think that alpha gal can be more challenging is the delay um, and the severity um, because it's that would always leave a question mark in my mind. The cause and effect for most people with food allergies is pretty clear. I ate this 30 seconds later, I'm feeling like this. Um, and, uh, and then the other piece is the environmental side and I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. I am a, I'm a fervent griller. Uh, I, I enjoy great steak. I enjoy, you know, and probably I was doing well with the audience and now they're like, turn this jerk off. Um, but I, uh, but I, uh, but I enjoy it and I would just into, uh, and I understand the challenges there. Um, and also the other pieces, the, you know, we're working on a federal initiative that would label medicine and mammalian byproducts are in so many things. Uh, and I 
we worked. I personally tried to get mammalian byproducts part of this bill um, that was going to label medicine and was unfortunately uh, turned down by the bill sponsor on that. But it's some it's an area, frankly, uh, the alpha gal community is big uh, and we need to recognize and understand their struggle and, and do more to help them. So, yeah. We really appreciate you acknowledging the complexities that come with this. It's been rewarding to become sort of a part of the food allergy community. And, you know, once you figure out that you do have alpha-gal, I think you reach a point where it becomes, I mean, it'll never be normal, right? (laughs) I'm probably not going to go back to grilling a steak on the grill, which, you know what, though? If that's what brings you joy, I say go for it, Jason. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I'm mindful, right? I mean, I would never, you know, the the one thing that we try to do on advocacy is, and I think overall as a community is just try to educate and be considerate and thoughtful, be the types of humans I think we all strive to be. Um, And so clearly I think there's a kindness factor that that's frankly, the community embodies that we need others outside the community just to understand, take a step back. It's not the worst thing in the world not to have peanuts or tree nuts on an airplane. You're not going to, you're not going to die, but guess what? Somebody three rows behind you could. And so, you know, uh, I just, I just, you know, I just think we can, we all can do better. um, And a little more tolerance and patience goes a long way. So. And I I do think that's a beautiful point to share because that's something that we've both talked about after being around the amount of children and teens and young adults at the summit is that these kids have a level of compassion and awareness that a lot of adults don't have. So yeah. it's, it's going to be really amazing to see them become adults and how they show up in the world, right? They're already showing up in this really big way. So that I feel like is an incredible silver lining to navigating a potentially fatal allergy, you know, at such a young age and they just show up with such kindness. And I don't know, it's been very inspiring to watch that, you know, when we've been at fair and I'm eager to just see how that blossoms for them as well. Um, Is there any other, you know, are there any other big initiatives or projects that FAIR has been working on that, I mean, that (laughs) what we've been talking about is such a huge project, but are there other things on the horizon for FAIR? Yeah, I mean, in in advocacy, like uh, you name the state and not name the state, but in it depends upon the state. Uh, we are doing different things. Restaurant training laws, uh, restaurant training bills, making the restaurant experience better, safer, uh, easier for the food allergy community um, is something that's on our horizon. We're working on a bunch of different states on that. Earlier this year, we were able to pass a law in uh, Connecticut and Texas. Um, Texas has seen a number of different tragedies. Uh, And now they have a food allergy awareness law uh, in place. Um, And so there's more than 3 million people with food allergies in Texas. Um, And so it's, it's, it's great. Um, The one thing I do want to flag for those of listening who might be interested in further advocacy, uh, come to Washington, DC. We're going to hold our um, annual, uh, what, what's considered or called a fly-in, though for many people they're driving in or they're training in, but it's March 4th through 6th. Uh, basically how it works is on March 4th, we gather for a little uh, celebration, a little party. On March 5th, we spend the day uh, in a training session where advocates learn about the issues that they're going to go uh, talk to members of Congress and staff about the next day. We hear from families and why a certain bill was introduced. We practice how to lobby. Uh, and then on uh, and then on March 6th, we all get on buses, uh, go up to the Hill. We, we gather on the steps of the Capitol for a great picture or a few. And then off people go to meet with their their members of the U.S. House and uh, and uh, and the Senate to push some bills that would help and benefit the food allergy community. Uh, that's the big thing on my agenda. Like that. That's uh, that's not that far away. It's in March, and 
Um, and so that's the, that's, yeah, that, that is the, that is an annual event that I oversee and that uh, we'd love to have folks from the Alpha Gal community uh, participate in. What a fantastic program that is from start to finish. And we can yeah. certainly help you with getting information out about that yeah. as we approach the date. I think the more people we can get, the better. And it makes me happy to think about Alpha Gal being represented there too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. While we may not have a specific Alpha Gal bill per se, right. I, I like to believe that there will be benefits for the entire community, uh, more research funding for appropriations uh, and a few other things. But who knows, there may be, we may be able to find uh, an Alpha Gal specific bill. The other thing I do want to mention is uh, we understand that coming to Washington, D.C. is expensive. Staying in a, a nice hotel where we're at is expensive. Um, we offer stipends um, and there should be hopefully information on our website um, by later this month um about all that information uh and if there's not you can just send me an email uh jlindy at foodallergy.org and i'll be happy to be in touch with you uh and then let you know when the stipend process starts but we want to bring look i want to bring people to washington dc who haven't been or was, were last here many years ago for a class field trip um, and, uh, and i want to make sure that we have members of the alpha gal community here as well uh pam Trana, uh, an Alpha Gal uh, member and I met at our fly-in three years ago or three and a half years ago. Uh, and we held it a week before COVID shut down Congress and the country. Um, and so she's a, a great advocate and uh, someone I'm looking forward to seeing in Washington, but would love uh, additional and other uh, members of the Alpha Gal community to come as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. we'll put all the information on how to sure. get you again in the in the all yeah. the show notes. <laughs> sure. Okay. So our very last question, as we always preface, we hear that it's the hardest question that we ask. And based on some of our previous conversation, we know that you are also interested in music as you've been identifying some of the posters and records behind Candace and yes. I in our video screen. <laughs> yeah. We talk all the time about joy here at Two Alpha Gals. And so one thing when we've had to give up so many other things that we have not had to give up is our music. And Candace and I rely on that. It brings us both so much joy. So what I'd like to know, is there a song that brings you joy either in this moment or for all time, or you can broaden it to an album or an artist, no. just <laughs> however you want to answer the question. Oh, I've got many that bring me joy. Some <laughs> motivate me. All right, I'm gonna go off off uh, character. Like you look at me, suburban dad, right? This sort of thing. So, song that brings me joy is "Mothership Connection" by Parliament Funkadelic. The yeah. lines, the lines in early on, put a glide in your stride and a dip in your hip, and come on board to the mothership. <laughs> I mean, come on, ladies. I mean. George Clinton and his group of like 25 people on stage when they were really at it when George was a much younger man. I mean, I, I'm a Parliament Funkadelic fan. I know it runs against type, uh, but I hear that. And, uh, and it's got a classic opening riff. The bass line starts. Uh, often this song will always, this song goes into uh, swing, uh, sweet, swing Low, Sweet High, Sweet Chariot. And for those of you in the P-Funk community, you know what happens next is when they were touring, the actual spaceship they actually had a spaceship that would come down and land uh, on the uh, on the stage. Uh, and that spaceship is at the African-American Museum, the Smithsonian African-American Museum. Uh, and I was never prouder of getting a, getting a picture in front of it. There are so many things in that museum that were uh, difficult and challenging and and wonderful, but staying in front of that 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 spaceship was great. So yes, uh, Parliament Funkadelics Mothership Connection is the song that brings me joy. I love it. I love that so much. And just the way you described it, we can see and hear the joy in you as you're talking about it. So yes, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. We loved our conversation and hope that we can do a check-in 
yeah with you <laughs> yeah that'd be great and i'd love nothing more to have the alpha gals you know maybe you do a little quick check-in pod from the uh from the fly-in next march yes. not not trying to not <laughs> trying to get on your calendar for next year ladies hey, but we'd i would love, love it. To, i'd love to have a live from washington uh sort of uh sort of pod um anyway okay. all right I think we should plan on it yes good absolutely good. All right. Well, thank you again, Jason. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you for joining us today on In the Tall Grass. Visit us at 2alphagals.com. That's T-W-O alphagals.com. Or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at 2alphagals. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Ticks suck, but life doesn't have to.